Happy first contact day, everyone. Hello, my friends. How are you? It's a bit weird seeing you again so quickly, but it's a nice weird that we get another episode to go through straight away after that wallop of a first episode the other day, not even last week. We're going to jump, obviously, into episode two and go through all of the ups and downs. But before we do that, what I want to do is I want to take a second right up the front here to go through the This Season on Discovery trailer that aired at the end of the broadcast version of episode one. So if you don't want any spoilers and you don't want to go through any trailers, which I completely understand, I want to say skip ahead about two or three minutes in this video and you won't get it, okay? So hopefully the wonderful Chris will put up a really big way of going skip ahead this much or, or, or even just like a big graphic change or something. Tucked right into the end of episode one is the now somewhat standard this season on trailer. And I think it really, it doesn't give an awful lot away except for one thing that it massively gives away in the trailer. You will remember that previously, when the season trailer came out, this is the one that came out a couple of months ago, we went through it frame by frame, as we enjoy doing, and we spotted that at least some of the action was going to take place in a Constitution class sickbay. We, you know, we know the set so well now from Strange New Worlds. And what's more is on top of that, we saw Terran Empire emblems on the uh, display screens. This trailer confirms what ship that they're on. We surmised previously that it would be the USS Defiant, that it would involve a trip over to the Mirror Universe, and we know that the USS Defiant was transported over to the Mirror Universe thanks to the episodes In a Mirror Darkly. This trailer, nestling the clips in around a lot of, a lot of action, this season sees Maul and Locke and a whole load of holographic decoys having a shootout with Buck and Burnham in, we see it in a wide shot, it is most definitely the sick bay set that we're very used to from Strange New Worlds. We see that same shot again of Locke standing in front of the Terran Empire symbol. Burnham goes, you couldn't have said hello first, and Maul says, you couldn't have just left us alone. So this definitely supports the idea that, well, Discovery will be chasing after Maul and Locke. We can only surmise that they're gonna chase them as far as the Mirror Universe. Okay, are you ready for me to go through it now? The ship they're on is not the USS Defiant, it's the Enterprise. Yes, there is a shot of Bur Buck and Burnham on a shuttle flying towards the Enterprise, which is seemingly entombed in some sort of nebula. We, we did the fun thing. We zoomed in. It is 1701. I can only presume it's ISS Enterprise. Uh, it was a little bit unclear, but if we have the Terran emblems on board the ship, that would support the fact that this is the ISS Enterprise. If indeed that is the case, then one wonders, are we being set up for some crossovers and a whole bunch of cameos? Strange New Worlds and Discovery obviously both film in Canada, so it would seemingly not be that difficult to have cameos from the Strange New World crew turn up in Discovery. I think we're all hoping for a little bit of Ethan Peck with the evil goatee. What we don't know as of yet is when this ship is set. So we know that we have our characters from the 32nd century on board this ship. Does that mean that the ISS Enterprise survived for well over a thousand years in the Terran Empire? I suspect not. I suspect there's a little bit of time travel going on. We have no idea because we do not have a context to these clips. There is a further shot, a bit of a glory shot, of the underside of the Enterprise later on. And it looks like it's stuck in some sort of, be it a wormhole or maybe a black hole or some sort of shakari. The first thing when we were watching it, Chris says to me, it's like, maybe we're going to get Mirror Universe Cybok. Because, think about it, Burnham and Spock would be great to see. Uh, Sinico Martin Green and Ethan Peck back together again on screen. Poor Sarek's dead. He got offed by Emperor Giorgio. Is, is this the time to introduce Cybok? Perhaps? Maybe? Is he like a hardcore logic Vulcan in this one? Is he still joined with God even in the Terra universe? What do they need with a starship? 
There's plenty of other little bits in the trailer. That, that will, that's the biggest takeaway from the trailer. We have plenty of scenes of running and shooting. It does seem like Burnham and Maul are going to have quite a few fist fights in this season. We have lots of scenes of Culber, Buck, Burnham. We have Tilly and Burnham both sharing the same kind of disguise. W one scene sees Burnham with a sort of a bionic eye, uh, which um, well, I hope it didn't hurt. And plenty of scenes of th they're all getting going to get shot at. That's going to happen. There's one brilliant scene. I think it was in one of the earlier trainers where you have Reno and she's got like a little like, kind of toolbox with her. And it just looks brilliant. We do get lots of Rainer as well. And I'm going to use that as my segue into this episode. Now that that section of the video is dealt with, um, welcome back. If you're just jumping straight to this bit, thank you for sticking with us. If you watched through the breakdown, would you join me for season five, episode two of Star Trek Discovery, Under the Twin Moons? The episode begins in the hangover of the end of la uh, well, the previous episode. The revelation that we are chasing the technology, the knowledge of the progenitors who were introduced to us in the chase. First of all, I want to say, and I, wanna, I said it last week as well, this show is gorgeous. It opens up with what I'm just calling space porn, and that's my first up. Burnham is reflecting on the things that she's learned. We have that great holographic image of Salome Jens as the female progenitor. Saru enters her quarters and discusses that he too has been going through the existential questions of who are we, what are we, where do we come from? But even though they have to celebrate the fact that Saru's moving up in his career, they also have to commiserate the fact that Saru's leaving Discovery, there is a much more pressing thing to look at, and that brings President Rillick back to Discovery. No relation. I'm really, really just glad to see her again. Rillick and Vance are leading an inquiry against Rainer and Burnham, although it's definitely more pointed at Rainer over what happened on Kamau and, of course, the avalanche. Callum Keith Rennie is very, very good. It seems like a simple way to describe it as Rainer because he's very clearly been on the job for years. Don't tell me how to do my job. I know what I'm doing. I made a decision in the moment. He's very gruff and he's very over the top. And in fact, Vance has to shout him down at one point to the to the point where it really goes, okay, we're going to take a break. But there is one bit that I did like is when Burnham is effectively being set up by Rillick to speak against Rainer. And Rainer, a bit like, I liken this to Vance coming in in the previous episode and effectively giving his authorization to Tilly to hack into the mainframe uh, without saying it in so many words. Rainer turns to Burnham and says, well, you didn't have any problems saying what you thought in the field. I took that as a bit of a, I'm not going to take this personally. You're being asked a question, answer the question. And I really liked that exchange. That was an up for me. The inquiry does not go well for Rainer. I think we could all see that from the moment he started speaking. It was like, oh yeah, no. Things are distracted by Vance turning around to Burnham and saying, okay, do you know where you're going? Yes, we're going to Valine. We're going to the planet of Lyric, uh, which not spelled the way you would think there's an E in this version. There was a cool little moment as well. I actually forgot to mention this. In Burnham's quarters, when she and Saru are talking, the, the dots are hoovering all the dust off Discovery that they're saying like, yeah, it didn't just vanish. It's still on it. Um, I like continuity. Vance does ask Burnham before they leave, how does she feel about the addition to the crew that she's made? Hello, Cleveland Booker. How are you? And they both make the point that while yes, there is history and yes, there is going to be a moment or two where people are not 100% comfortable, he has already proven himself useful this season, let alone what's happened before. And most importantly, it brings Grudge back. We, 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 we love Grudge. There's also a cool little moment where Burnham pulls out a holographic mouse and Grudge is like, really? It's clever. It's comfortable and uncomfortable at the same time. They, this isn't like last week where Buck and Burnham sort of in the heat of adrenaline 
have this great moment of understanding and it's very mature. That's now past and yet they're still together. So there is an inherent discomfort in that. And it's both obvious, but also equally as obvious is how they're both trying to be professional about it. I do quite like it. This scene also canonifies, canonize, canonizes the term Action Saru. I love it. We've been calling him Action Saru for a couple of years now, and it's now in the show, which I'm really happy about. Because I think ever since season two, three, four, every time the spines come out, it's like, ah yeah, ah yeah. And I love, I just, I, I love how these things that come up in behind the scenes circles, make it into the show. It also sets up another example. We got this last week where their communication is not as tight knit as it was. Another example of, we see it later on in the episode, jumping ahead slightly, just Michael and Saru having a chat where Michael says, oh, you know, I heard about Book's nickname for you, Action Saru. And Saru goes, mm, Book didn't come up with that, Reno did. And it's little moments like that that suggest as connected as Burnham is with everyone, they also have experiences, they also have relationships. I actually think it's quite a good reminder that even in a show that is primarily focused on the main character, that there is stories happening around them. And that's where Discovery has always been quite different, is that it has been quite single character centric. And it's little moments like this that I think help to broaden it a bit. Discovery arrives at Lyric and Tilly, thankfully, has joined them on this mission. She is officially there as a science advisor. Working with her is Adira. So there's a lot of fun back and forth between the two of them as they try to figure out the defenses of Lyric, if you will. It sets up a couple of quick one-liners very quickly. Uh, Tilly at one point says, don't worry, I will keep my eyes peeled, which is really gross when you think about it. Up, oh, Tilly delivers these sort of side quips so well. Uh, really, really enjoy it. But then we get what is perhaps my favorite line of the entire episode, which is Burnham turns to Saru and says, last dance, and Saru answers, I will follow your lead. That is absolutely an up. It was in the trailer, loved it then, loved it in the context of this episode. Book is not joining them on the planet. Book is aboard the ship because part of his job is to try and track down Maul and Locke. Of course, that's what the grand, the overall theme of the full mission is this. And we get between Book and Colbert this understanding. Colbert comes in and says, how are you doing? And Book says, well, I'm trying to help the refugees. And Colbert says, no, 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 no. I didn't ask what you were doing. I asked how you were doing. And Colber seemingly gives the best hugs in the world and I really want one. So this up is for Book and Colber because Book and Colber have, they have this relationship. It's an understanding without it being too over telegraphed. Obviously Colber was ship's counselor, possibly still is, but was ship's counselor for quite a long time and understands some of the pain at least that Book was going through. So to see that, Book walks in and you see that moment of hesitation. David Ajala does this very well. Does this moment of, am I welcome here? And sure, Colbert's like, come here and give me a hug. Where have you been? This will lead to Book figuring out a way to directly contact Maul and Locke. Down on the planet, we get a really cool, another TNG reference. I know I should keep this for Cetacean Observations, but the Promelians used to use this planet as a burial site. I mean, that's deep cut. Uh, the Promelians were, however, constantly warring and they like to keep weapons and defense systems around. Kind of see where this is going. Some of the trailers and some of the promotional spots have shown in this leafy forest. So we get the leafy forest episode now, I'm assuming of Burnham and Saru running away from weapons fire. Well, boy howdy, do we get that in this episode. What we also get, however, is constant reminders of just how far Michael and Saru have come together. They have a talk where they literally discuss Burnham arriving on Discovery as a mutineer and, you know, someone who was a misfit and someone who, you know, what are you doing here? And Saru, I mean, we remember 
you know, sort of saying, you are someone to be feared. And for that same person to then turn around and say how much you've grown and, and, and how you've improved and worked on yourself and to see what that means to Burnham is just phenomenal. That is an absolute up from me. Overall, I think Michael and Saru are the true beating hearts of Discovery. Probably other characters I could say would be in the running for that, but the two of them and how their relationship has grown, which is why if you'll forgive me a moment of being really mushy, that's my Latinum up of the week. Michael and Saru on the planet, but their relationship overall, which feeds into how they, how they interact. Right, enough of that mush. So they start getting shot at, okay? So this Permelian uh, massive head statue thing, it's got four eyes. No, it doesn't. It's got four launchers for drones. And these drones are not very nice. Think the arsenal of freedom. Yeah, no, they don't want to hug. So they're firing at them and firing at them and they you know, talk to the ship and they're like, hi Tilly, how's it going? Help! Burnham says, you know, we're really losing our footing down here. And it just cuts to Tilly going, oh my God, who lost a foot? Again. Mary Wiseman taken up the delivery of these things, even in the heat of the adrenaline. And we get action Saru. Saru says, look, I will draw their fire. And you know, we'll, we have to find a way of, of you know, escaping. And then wouldn't you know it, Tilly turns around and Rainer's just standing there in front of her. The holographic tech. Uh, and as much as I complained about it last week, and I, I don't like glitchy holograms, it's better in this episode. Uh, you still establish the fact that yes, he's a hologram, but it's not constant. And so he pushes Tilly and Adira, think, think, think. What do we know? What do we know? We're not dealing with the Romelians of the 32nd century. We are dealing with a thousand year old Promelia or even longer ago. And they're able to work with Zora to come up with what might be powering these weapons systems. All of them together, Tilly, Adira, Rainer, Saru and Burnham effectively figure out, use electromagnetic pulse in the same way that you would today, and that will disable the weapon systems. It's a, a sort of a fist pump moment of, yeah, teamwork, I like it. That's why it's an up. Action Saru runs off to draw the fire of the drones using the spines. Great to see the spines again. And Burnham is able to overload her and Saru's phaser, stick it in the giant head, and sets off this EMP. Brilliant Tilly in a moment of elation to thank Rainer, and of course, he's gone. They don't need him anymore. I'm very interested to see what happens with this character. Although it doesn't happen in this scene per se, there is a moment between Tilly and Adira where Tilly's talking about how she's a little bit frustrated that a lot of her cadets aren't really rising to the challenge of being officers. Adira then, in contrast, talks about how they've been on a mission on their own for the longest time without Grey. Remember Grey? Um, I'll come back to that in a moment. And how it feels good. And Tilly says, and you're not sure how to feel about that, are you? And Adira agrees because they're so used to having shared so much time with Grey before this that now the fact that they are happy on their own is just as confusing. I say, do you remember Grey? Because Grey just was barely in season four. Um, hopefully this isn't just a name check and, and we will actually get some of Grey in season five. And I think we will. Shutting down the weapons on the planet gives Burnham and Saru a chance to breathe and to head toward the main pyramid, which has been their destination. Aboard the ship, Book comes up with a bit of a novel idea. He has MacGuffin, you know, kind of the, the a burner phone, if you like. And he says, well, they don't know me, Mon and Locke. Why don't I just see if I can buy the diary off them? I'll just contact them as if I'm a smuggler like anyone else and see if I can buy it off them. And Stamets and Culmer are just like, do you know what? Why not? So they clear engineering. Book makes the phone call and we get Maul and Locke in holographic form. They appear. Arguably, Book really shows his hand that, you know, he's a bit, bit pro-Federation. You have Maul is definitely not pro-Federation and Locke is the one who seems to be sort of observing everything that's going on. Book sort of gives enough away for Maul to be like, yeah, I'm, 
I'm gonna head out. Uh, we, you know, we don't need anyone. You know, there's just the two of us. And I want to say this exchange was good. Obviously, we've mostly seen Maul and Locke shooting at people or being shot at. So getting a second to just kind of breathe with them is nice. The sequence ends with Maul hanging up the call and Buck looking to quote Culber like he's seen a ghost. Down on the planet, Burnham and Saru discover that there is a pillar which has been ravaged by phaser fire, which to them goes, damn, Maul and Locke beat us here. But thanks to Saru's magic Kelpian eyes, he is able to trace. There's bacteria in the indents of where the writing was. They were able to scan and see that there is a five stanza Romulan poem written on the thing. But oh wait, where's the fifth stanza? Thanks very much, Saru and his magic Kelpian strength. It's underneath this pillar. So they're able to get this full poem. They beam up to the ship and they even, in fairness to Burnham, they get a bunch of these dots to go down and repair the pillar as well. I like that. Showing a bit of respect for sacred ground. Fair play. Aboard the ship, they translate the poem. We get some nice fun Romulan Easter eggs in that. But the first four stanzas seem to suggest that the next bit of the clue will be on Beta Z. However, while that's what Maul and Locke found, Saru and Burnham found the fifth bit, which suggests, and I'm paraphrasing here, that the next clue will be on a world where you have the union of two minds, there's opalescent water, there's learning to live as one, and Adira, of course, says, the next clue's on Trill. Like I said, I have a feeling we're going to see Grey. With that, they're able to leave Lyric and head back toward Federation HQ. We get the lovely jumping thing, which by now I'm totally sold on, by the way. Spore drive, gimme gimme, love it. And just to sort of, I guess, almost wrap up this bit of the storyline, Culber checks on Book and says, are you okay? What, what was that? And Book says, well, look, I recognized Maul's birthmark. And Culber's like, what? He says, yeah, now I haven't met her, but I do know who she is. She was the daughter of my mentor, Cleveland Booker IV, which makes her the closest thing to family Book has. I had to think about this one. All right, there is a conspicuous absence of these in this episode, and I had to think about this one, and I thought, in the whole galaxy. Hmm. But there's enough that we don't know about Book, and there's enough that we don't know about Kui Zhan and the people who are there and weren't there anymore. Uh, because I take from this that I assume she is at least from Kui Zhan. That's That's what I take from this. I'm not going to down the small universe of it all if, I'm, if I think they use it. But basically, what I don't want this to be is episode 10, book talks her down by the power of family. That's not where I want this to go. So I'm not downing it, but we'll see. Well, as Discovery is pulling in, Burnham speaks to Saru about, well, this is it then, that was your last mission. And she jokes and says, you know, you don't have to make any decisions right now. I did tell Detmer to pull in real slow, which I love as a line. I thought that was very good. And there's lovely back and forth between Saru and Burnham. Burnham says, do you have any last bit of advice for me? And Saru goes, I feel a great deal of power in this moment. Again, taken up. I just love their relationship, how it's grown between each other, the trust and the love that exists between these two characters. Once Saru has disembarked and Discovery is once again in dry dock, Burnham comes to Dadmiral Vance. Now, obviously I like the word Dadmiral Vance, but no, because she walks into the office and he's there trying to learn his geometry so that he can help his daughter in school. Oh, that was such a cute little throwaway moment. I thought it was great. Um, and now I just, I have to say, I've been sitting on this for the whole episode. I have a down, right? Could they have telegraphed any more that Rainer's going to be the new number one? While also saying, who could it be? Mm, I don't know who the new number one's going to be. I could be anyone. Like they even, I think the fact that they even bother to name drop, well, Tilly wants to go back to the Academy and no problem, by the way, with Tilly being first officer, because we've done that before. We've, we've covered that as a storyline. So yes, she's an ensign. Yes, we, we did that to death. We knew it was going to be Rainer from the first scene of the episode. And to kind of to kind of drag it out the way that they did, it was a bit like, I can't be the only one that picked up on this. Having said that, I really like Rainer. 
I really like him. Like Callum Keith Rennie, Rainer, he's an up. He is a an old grizzled fisherman who's seen a thousand seas and he'll see a thousand more. So even though he's been asked to take an early retirement by Vance, that just means he's not a captain. So it leaves him absolutely there and ready to go to be a first officer. And Burnham, I think it's a brilliant idea. Burnham needs someone who will keep her on her toes. Who, who better than someone who'll be like, what is, what is going on on this ship? Come here to me now and I'll show you some discipline. And I am looking forward to that. I will also have to say, up for that gorgeous shot of the Discovery. Now, my friends, after that, will you come join me in Cetacean Observations? This is actually Sean filming at a different time because since the release of episode one and going through the Easter eggs, it seems one of them decloaked. Yes, it does appear that I didn't see a fairly large cloaking device at one point in the episode. I maintain it was cloaked. No, 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 missed that one. Uh, so thanks, Jorg. No, really, thank you, Jorg. You've no idea how much you're just doing incredible work by going through these episodes frame by frame. Like, thanks so much. So, yes, that's flipping cloaking device in the shop as well. Slightly good news as well for people based in the US that if you don't have a Paramount Plus subscription, the first episode of season five, episode one, Red Directive, the one we're reviewing, is available to watch for free on YouTube. Now we have in the opening of this scene, Salome Jens, the return of the progenitor from last week. We have a shout out to the Breen and the Orions. Rainer saying, you know, Starfleet needs someone to watch their backs. We have the return of Grudge, who's not really an Easter egg, but I just love her. Action Saru, which as I said before, seems to be a callback to earlier versions of Saru. We get that lovely wide shot of Federation HQ. We have the Antares, we have the new Constitution class, we have Marian class, Saturn class, French class and courage class are all dotted around federation hq the promelians oh captain picard would be so jealous when i saw the collapsed statue on lyric first thought it's mr bilbo's trolls we get shout outs to things like deuterium and of course latinum as well the return of saru's magic eyes remember back in season two with the red angel it's saru's eyes that are able to pick out at such a distance the red angel Jolan True is the standard greeting in Romulan that we see as part of this poem. And of course, what we get as well as the false front door, this idea that was introduced in Star Trek Picard's first season, that friends and family would know where to enter a Romulan's household, which is how they figure out that the poem is not finished because it is not so obviously displayed. We get shout outs to Beta Z, shout out to Trill. Saru's knife makes a return as well. Saru and Burnham, when having their final discussion of the episode, talk about what it is that's most important. And Saru talks about the importance and, and how he, he feels a connection to the journey. And I feel that those words have become so indelibly connected to Star Trek Voyager. Uh, particularly in, we have the documentary coming up as well, and the toast that's given in Endgame, that it feels like a gentle but deliberate nod to the complete journey of the USS Voyager. Rainer, when he feels that he's, he's done, feels like he's gonna be given command of a garbage scow, and I couldn't not think of the Klingons from the Trouble with Tribbles. Perhaps not so much an Easter egg, but certainly a theme of the episode is the idea of second chances and how Saru gave Burnham a second chance and Burnham is giving Rainer a second chance. As I say, perhaps not an Easter egg, but certainly thematically a comment on Starter Discovery overall. That is everything for this week, folks. We had two episodes back to back, so it's a lot to digest. So take your time, go back, watch them again. Thank you so much. Thank you for following along. Thank you for subscribing. Thank you for supporting the channel. Uh, speaking of support, please don't forget, pick up a copy of this month's SFX magazine. Uh, it's a fantastic piece on discovery and just support print media as well while you're at it. We will be back next week with episode three of Star Trek Discovery season five. I have been Sean. You can follow me on the various socials at Sean. Remember, you can follow Chris at Edit Chris Edit on Twitter and Instagram. And most importantly, please follow Trek Culture on Twitter, on Blue Sky, on TikTok. We're, of course, on Instagram as well at Trek Culture YT. 
What do you think of the season so far? Already I'm seeing a lot of chatter about this online. What are your thoughts? Are you enjoying it? Do you think, ah, oh, more of the same, something totally new, or what are they doing? I want to know what you think. Let us know. You're awesome. Please live long and prosper to a world that is increasingly, increasingly frightening. I want to say move forward with peace and show that peace and love to your friends, to your family, to your neighbors, because I think if more people do that, we really do stand a chance of just getting this thing right. You're awesome. I'll talk to you very soon. Thanks.